In chapter 4.1's lecture, we're going to pick up on the role of government in something called market failure. So what is the role of government in a market system? Remember, there was one thing we talked about in the three um, main questions that all economies have to answer, and that was, um, what should we produce, right? What goods are we going to produce? <clears throat> As we saw in the previous chapter, in a market-based system, it's buyers and sellers make that decision through their interactions. The buyers send their signals to um, business firms. For instance, the example, one of the examples I used was what uh, electric cars. How does Tesla know to build more electric cars or fewer electric cars? Well, it's all determined by how many people are willing to buy the electric cars. So if there's a huge market, if there's a large number of buyers for them, then firms respond because you can make a profit selling these cars, they will produce more of them. But of course, if people are worried about the range that you get out of an electric car and instead choose to buy a gasoline powered car in order to go to Disney World where you can get it refueled very, very easily as opposed to plugging in your electric car, then of course the market system produces gasoline cars. So the, uh, the market system does not produce things based on some kind of theoretical ideal of we should produce things that are good for the planet or something like that. We produce things that people are willing to pay for. So it's what people want is what market systems do. So in a state-run system, of course, those in power make those decisions. So if those in power decide we need to have more electric cars, they simply force it to happen by either controlling the business firms, controlling the customers, controlling the price, controlling something. Uh, governments can force the decision to move in a different direction. So can either of these systems or a combination of the two produce the mix of output desired by society in general? So what we're going to try to answer the question is, is can a market system achieve everything it needs to achieve in order to have the right outcome for society in general, or does it need some help from the government, or could a government do it completely on its own? First thing we're going to discuss here in order to try to answer that question is discuss the concept of market failure. So let's go ahead and just read the slide together. The market mechanism produces goods and services and yields jobs, wages, and a distribution of income. Is this the best possible mix of outcome or should government intervene? Let's take a look at this particular slide and try to answer that question. Now, what we're looking at here in the orange curve, this is the production possibilities curve that we did in a much earlier chapter. If you remember every dot on the curve, and we have two of them here, shows the trade-off between any two goods that can be produced. In this case, on the y-axis, we're going to increase production as we go vertically in healthcare, and on the x-axis, we're going to put in all other goods so that we can make this applicable to the entire society. Now, here's two possible locations. One of them we're going to call M, which stands for the market mix. Because customers spending their own money have decided they would rather have less health care than at point X, you notice this is down here, is less, in order to have what? More um, all other goods, which would be the other private goods, cars, houses, vacations, computers, you know, all the other things that you can buy with your income. So this is where the market ended up, this level of production of both health care here and uh, production of goods and services here. Now, let's just assume we could know this this is actually the most difficult part, is to know what the true answer is. But let's just assume, for the, for, uh, to have an argument, let's, talk, let's assume that the proper or the optimal outcome would be at this level here, level X. Now, level X has more health care in it. And then, of course, as you know, because of the production possibilities frontier, if we have more health care, what has to happen to all other goods? Well, they have to decline, right? Business firms only have so many workers, they only have so much machinery, they only have so much capital, there's only so many natural resources in existence. If we decide to apply more of it to healthcare, that means we have less available to apply to all other goods. So point X we're going to assume is the optimal. If that's true, then clearly the market system got it wrong, okay? Or it's suboptimal as we have in our nice little box here. The market fails, quote unquote, when it produces the wrong or suboptimal mix of output. Now, this is merely, at this point, a theoretical argument. Knowing whether the market is actually not producing the right amount of healthcare 
could be a very difficult thing to answer, but we're going to assume it. So let's take a look at some mechanisms of market failure. The market mechanism, according to the previous slide, did not lead to the optimal point on the production possibilities curve. So the market failure establishes a basis for government intervention. In other words, if you can prove that the market is suboptimal on something, you can make an argument that the government needs to step in and change the types of goods and services being produced. So what would cause a market to fail? Well, we have four uh, concepts listed and we'll go through them as slides. I'm not going to go into detail on this slide, but I just want to give you a list. There can be public goods and public goods cause market systems to fail. Externalities cause market systems to fail. Market power, otherwise known as monopoly, also cause market systems to fail and inequity or unfairness can cause a market system to fail. So these are the four things that can go wrong. Let's take a look at one of them in particular. Let's take a look at private goods as an example of things that go right so that when we can come up with and start talking about public goods in the next slide, we'll be able to have a compare and contrast. So let's remind ourselves about what the market mechanism does. So the market mechanism does a good job of signaling consumer demands for private goods and services. Well, what are private goods and services? Let's take a look at our next uh, bullet point. A private good or service is one whose consumption by one person excludes consumption by others. Let's think about an example. Um, you get a Coke out of the Coke machine. Uh, let's say you're at a picnic. You pull a Coke out of the cooler. What happens to the amount of Cokes available for others at the, uh, at the picnic now? Do you agree that if you take one, it excludes others from having that one that you have? So all private goods by definition, when one person consumes it, there's less available for others to consume. So you buy a car off the car dealer's lot, there's fewer cars for other people to buy. You take a Coke out of the Coke machine or the cooler, there's fewer Cokes available for others. You buy a house and move into it, there's fewer houses for other people to live in. You start to get the point, I hope. Most goods are private goods, actually. Oh, your computer. You buy a computer, then obviously someone else can't use the computer, right? If you're using it, other people can't use it at the same time. Uh, your clothes. If you're wearing a pair of jeans, no one else can wear the pair of jeans while you're wearing them. So your use excludes consumption by someone else. Like I said, the vast majority of goods are private goods. So it turns out that the market mechanism works really, really good with private goods because the supply and demand curves capture that information through buying and selling, don't they? So the market price lets people know how scarce the item is. Each person makes a decision. Do I want a tutor at this price? Do I want an electric car at this price? Do I want a pair of jeans at this price? and each one of us makes our own decision. Sometimes the decision is yes, sometimes it's no. It all depends on our tastes and preferences, our incomes, all those kinds of things. We now have to make a decision. Given my limited income that I have, what would I rather have? Would I rather have another pair of jeans or would I rather hire a tutor to help me with my class? And then you now make the decision. So for private goods, the market mechanism works really, really well. But there are certain kinds of goods called public goods in economics. Now, we are using the term public goods in a technical way. Ordinary life public goods means anything the government is producing. So we call what uh, public school means the government is providing the school. But to an economist, a public good means something different. It means something very technical. So let's take a look at using the next bullet point to try to figure out what's different about a public good. So they are goods and services whose consumption by one person does not exclude consumption by another person. Let me give you an example. Let's assume we have a lighthouse and there's a bunch of ships going by and there's a big reef offshore. No one can see the reef if it wasn't for the lighthouse. So if I turn the lighthouse on and one ship goes by, does it stop any other ship from seeing the lighthouse? Well, of course not. The lighthouses are much taller than the ship. So even if the ship went close by the reef and near the, um, the lighthouse, it wouldn't block the light from all the other ships. So all the ships can see the light, whether one person's, um, whether one ship is out at sea, two ships, five ships, a thousand ships, it really makes no difference. No matter how many ships sail past the reef, they all get to see the light, irrespective of how many other people do it. 
So that's very different than the number of Cokes in a cooler at a picnic. Every time one person takes a Coke out, there's fewer Cokes available for others. But that's not true for lighthouses. Every time one person sees the lighthouse, it doesn't stop other people from seeing the lighthouse. So this is a very, very interesting kind of good because it triggers the next um, bullet point, the free rider dilemma. The free rider dilemma means that, uh, let's go ahead and just read the slide, then I'll try to come up with an explanation. So the communal nature of, pu of public goods, by communal nature, we mean we can all simultaneously use it without stopping anyone else from using it. The communal nature of public goods may cause some consumers to try to be, or to, to try for a free ride. So what is a free rider? An individual who reaps the direct benefits from someone else's purchase or consumption of a public good. So herein lies a very interesting problem. If you were trying to build a lighthouse as a private business person and you're going to charge people money in order to see your lighthouse, we now have a real problem. Remember, all transactions in a, in a market system have to be voluntary. You can't force people to pay for anything. You have to offer it to them and they can refuse. So. You've turned your light on and there's 50 ships going by. Three of them pay, so you have to leave the light on for the three of them. What are the other 47 gonna do now that they know you've left the light on and it, they get to see it whether they pay or not? How many of them are gonna to agree to pay? What do you think? Well, therein lies the free rider problem. This is what our description is for the free rider. So the example here would be one of the ship owners decided to just watch the light because the others paid they themselves won't pay because you can't make someone pay if they've turned down the service. So if you called up on a, let's say, a, um, a VHF radio, and you called out to the, the fourth ship, the one that's not paying and say, sir, do you want to pay for this light? The guy says, uh, no, I really don't think I need your light. I think I know where the reef is. I don't want to you know, enter into business with you. Well, you can't turn the light off because you've already got it on for the people who did pay, right? So the fourth person gets to free ride on what the others have done. This causes a serious problem, as you might suspect. Everyone waits to use the good for free. Once the three who did pay realized that the fourth ship didn't have to pay and still saw the same light, next time that the other ships go by the light, the first three guys that did pay, what do you think they will do next time? Well, aren't they gonna wait to see whether someone else pays? But then if everyone is waiting to see whether someone else pays so that they can just simply free ride on what the other person did, no one will pay. Now we got ourselves a problem. There appears to be no apparent buyer of the good. Everyone, you call them up on the radio, how many of you all want to pay for the light? And everyone keeps saying, no, I don't want to pay for the light. So the, obviously the lighthouse keeper can't afford to turn the light on for free. It costs electricity, right? So the lighthouse keeper says, oh, I guess no one really wants the light. And so no producer brings the light to market. But is that the true situation? Is it true that no one wants to know where the reef is? Well, of course the ship owners want to know where the reef is, right? They're only pretending they don't want to know because they're hoping some other person will pay so that they can simply free ride. But now I hope you see what the problem is. Markets in this example, meaning private business people, when they see the opportunity to build a lighthouse on a reef, will decide, you know, I don't think I want to do that. I'm going to put millions of dollars into this business and I have no way to know whether anyone is going to pay for it. I don't think I want to do this. So no one builds lighthouses. Is that the correct answer? What do you think? If we were looking at that production possibilities curve, the one I did with healthcare at one spot, you know, uh, the, the um, optimal outcome at one spot and the market outcome at another, we could use the lighthouse example would be a perfect example to use on that production possibilities curve. Go back to it when you have time and just mentally make the market outcome would be very low on lighthouses and very high on all other goods, but would it be the right spot? Clearly not. We really should put some amount of resources into lighthouses because in fact, ships really do benefit. We just can't get them to tell us the truth about how much they benefit because they're all trying to be free riders. So in that case, the market underproduces the particular good that's a public good, and then of course overproduces other private goods.